This is the Open Global Mind uh, weekly call on Thursday, October 26th. Um, we were just talking about David Graeber's book about the pirates in Madagascar. Um, An and anarchist uh, enterprise, apparently. So you just asked that I start AI Companion. It should have started already. You know, it, I'm confused by AI Companion. I turn it on and it sometimes gives me summaries and sometimes doesn't. I haven't figured it out yet. Oh, intriguing. Mine has been consistently good where I get a nice summary after every call and it, it's turned on automatically before all calls. Hi, Judy. Hi, how are you today? Good, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, and, uh, oops. Too many windows, too many buttons. We're in a state of button overwhelm. Too many notifications. Yeah, exactly. Um, where to go? Here we go. The Betis, the Betis, Betsimi Saraka people. Uh, and uh, the book is called Pirate Enlightenment or the Real Libertalia by David Graeber, and the leader is Ratsimilaho. That's a mouthful. Isn't it? <laughs> We're just picking the next M country that Doug should go visit because he seems to be doing the M's. He's in Malaysia right now. Much more temperate than Minnesota, I'm sure. The weather's been fantastic for the eight weeks I've been here. That's a long time. <laughs> Doug, Doug, is that feeling like permanent home now, or, or are you going to be hopping to other places? Well, who knows? OK, good answer. But it's feeling pretty home, pretty permanent. Have you heard the term cotty wampling? Yes. I've heard it, but I don't remember what it is. <laughs> it's basically to travel in a purposeful manner towards a vague destination. <laughs> um, and it's one of April, it's one of the books, in, one of the, the words in April's uh, Flux book, which is why I know about it. But it's a good work. It's a good word. And here's an essay. <clears throat> why you should cottywomple your way through life. Uh, I knew a person who once a year would put a dartboard behind him on the wall, face backwards with his back to the dartboard, throw a dart, and uh, on the board was, of course, a map of the world. So it would determine where he went next. Did they spend a lot of time on the yeah, ocean? Uh, I, I assume you keep you keep throwing until you hit land, right? Oh, like that, right. I think right. He did so land. Yeah. All right. Got to have some rules with dark games. Hey, Pete. <laughs> um, I went. I steered us back toward the music topic, and I don't know where anybody would like to start, or even if you are enthused about the topic. But we sensed a lot of enthusiasm last time we were on it. <clears throat> so. Um, do you want to say anything more about it than just the word music? What is the topic? Uh, music. Okay. Uh, and and I'm kind of I'm being vague intentionally because I don't know what might show up if I underdetermine the topic. Uh, yep. And uh, it would be really interesting to take us. You know, maybe it's music therapy. Maybe it's um, a friend of a friend of ours does sound therapy and has a whole room in her house with uh, gongs that you can sit under and uh, or, or tubular bells that she walks by and rings and a whole bunch of really interesting sound stuff. Go ahead, Doug. I have one to start with. If Plato says that you can tell the quality of a society by its music, what is our music telling us? Hmm. <laughs> Pete, do you have an answer to that? I, I don't. Um, although I have kind of an observation, which is um, when when society gets when there's a lot of stress, um, uh, you get better music. You know, so the Vietnam War made a lot of great music. Um, uh, so so anytime, like 
I feel stressed about the stuff going on in society. It's like, well, at least we'll get good pop songs out of it in five years or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I had a um, uh, kind of to maybe maybe kind of to to Gil's question, music. So music, what? And your answer is great, of course. Um, I would love to have um, a music call where I I had done a little bit of prep for show and tell um, uh, because. Um, because the because you know I have a bunch of stuff I would love to show and tell, um, but it's not something that I can I can uh, dig up on the fly. Except I have one thing I have a really interesting observation. Um, uh, uh, I think it was Ken uh, on our last music call introduced me to a new acapella pop acapella group that I love, um, the Korean group Matri. Um, so it was a, a wonderful thing to find. So that just that find made like six months of OGM calls worthwhile. Um, <laughs> and not that not that they're not worthwhile already, but you know, uh, now we've got like a, a bank of like you know really crappy calls that we could have that that are still the whole thing is worthwhile. Um, uh, so they do they do a cover of a. Um, a K-pop song, and the K-pop song is actually a, a kind of a fake K-pop song. It's by the the biggest K-pop band, boy band, um, but it was actually written by I think an Irish guy, maybe a Scottish guy, um, uh, and a young guy. It turns out uh, this this the particular song is an incredible uh, earworm, uh, and so I can tell. I, I think they actually shopped it around. The guy wrote it and and started playing it for different music producers, and they actually had like a bidding war for the song, and so this K-pop group uh, won the, the bidding war and um, did a good job with it. Uh, it's all in English, so it's it's kind of a stealth way for um, uh, BTS, the, the the band, to get more uh, world exposure. So. Um, so I I never really got this song um, from pop culture three years ago when it came out, and so I was hearing it for the first time, and I heard it for the first time by this uh, 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 acapella group, and it's enchanting. It's super super lovely, and I I play it over and over and over, um, and uh, the the group is super cute together, and they're super. The thing I like best about live performances is um kind of the interplay between the people working together at the same time to do a, a complicated harmonic you know harmonically constructed thing they then they do it socially kind of right everybody has to be on cue and doing this, this the beats at the right time and everything like that and they just do a superb job at it so i'm enchanted by this thing so then i went okay well i guess i have to listen to the real one i went over to the real one it's like, kind of like overproduced it's not as much fun it's kind of full of junk and blah blah um but anyway, um, the so the 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 odd the odd um, observation I wanted to make. Sorry for the long pre uh, uh, prelude. Um, it is a real like real intense earworm. I'm hearing it like five days later. You know, I I play it and then I'm like, okay, I'm not. I don't want to hear that. I I loved hearing the the uh, acapella group. I didn't really like the real one, but like over and over and over, um, it keeps playing in my head. And um, uh, not many songs are, have been that persistent for me as an earworm. And this one is really uh, nasty that way. So I thought it was an interesting observation to make that, that some are more than others. And this one is really intense. Which, what was which, the specific song, Pete? Um, it's a- uh, We're dying to be infected by I, the earworm. I, I, well, you know, the, I, I purposely kind of steered away from it, and I did a probably a poor job of like saying that you didn't want to hear the song, but, um, uh, but I purposely stayed away from it because I don't want to inflict an earworm on folks. Because literally, <laughs> I want I want to know what it is so I can avoid it. This, this is this is Pete wearing a, an audio mask. <laughs> an audio mask. I'm on, um, I'm on the Matri YouTube page, but it's got like a billion acapella songs. Uh, I have the name swapped out, um, and uh, I could sing it to myself, of course, no, no, because no, I hear no, it no, over no, and over no, and over no, and over. No, um, no, I'll put it in chat. So no, listen no. to the acapella one first, at least. <laughs> Do you want to put a um, trigger, because... trigger warning next to it when you post yeah. it? I'll put a trigger warning, yes. Um, uh, what's that? We have a trigger emoji. 
We should. There should um, be, totally. But if it was a gun, which would be natural, that would be a trigger in itself. So probably a bad idea to do that. <laughs> but it's an only a negative, it's pretty much a negative trigger. So a, a different trigger would be better. That, that reminds me, by the way, totally different, totally different topic. But uh, I remember uh, in social text um, up on the whiteboard, somebody was pretty good drawing um, figures. Uh, different kinds of like art stuff. Um, and we had our our, our uh, quarterly onsite. Um, we were a distributed company, so we had onsites instead of offsites. So during the onsite, uh, somebody, one of the things that came up was kill your darlings, um, a good kind of heuristic for creative endeavors. You know, don't get stuck on the thing that you, you love a lot. You know, you, you have to have a whole suite of things that you uh, candidate things to bring into business or new products or whatever. So uh, somebody drew that and they drew a puppy with, you know, cute little eyes. And then they drew a gun right next to the puppy's head. So anytime somebody says, kill your darlings or a gun emoji or something like that, I can still see that picture. It's an eye worm, I guess. I can still see that picture on the whiteboard. Stop this project or the puppy dies. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, listen to the acapella one first. Know that it's not a perfect recording. They used a single mic in front of uh, the five people or whatever, six people. Um, it's not a perfect recording, but it's a perfect performance. So, and I think yeah. this group Matri also does. They'll do song tunes like the Mario Brothers game tune a cappella. And so like a, a they do a great box job at mixed sound up rendition. They yeah. do. They do really crazy stuff. They'll do the Nokia ringtone. Uh, they'll do a bunch all of the, the movie studio like openings, all that kind of stuff. They do great sound effects. Um, I wish they did more pop songs, but the sound effects are great too. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, Gil, you had your hand up earlier. I did. It came down. I know. Sometimes it does that. Thanks. Um, although new in, in Zoom is that it will raise my hand for me sometimes. There's a, You can turn that feature on. Uh, it, it's usually the, on. It seems, seems to have gone off now. But anyway. Detect, detect raised hand is a thing you can turn on. Full of surprises. So three things. First of all, Pete, I'm delighted that OGM is finally proving worthwhile for you. That's really good to hear. Yeah, me too. I'm glad I paid off at least once. Yeah, Jerry, it's it's a long investment, but you know, we're we're done now. We can move I, on. And I feel like I feel like Pete's win might serve all of us just in case nobody else had a win. So totally. Totally. Um, um Doug, I didn't know Plato said that. I love that. If 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 um our music describes society, what does our music say about our society today? Incredibly diverse. That's the first thing that comes to my mind, both the society and the music. And I love the diverse. Well, so be it, Jerry. I love the diversity of the music. I love that I can kind of wander into any tradition, any style, any mood. Um, and lately, I've been finding lots of refuge in music. Um, you know, turn off the news and just go into a few hours of just music. Uh, and I'm finding myself, um, it's really interesting, just not categorizing, not not evaluating, judging, thinking about it, but just sort of dropping into it. Um, it uh, it's a, a, a it's a kind of meditation without knowing that it was. But I found I found myself just empty of everything but the music, um, and it's been a wonderful experience in general and very welcome right now. Uh, and third, I will say about uh, my favorite K-pop band, Pete, is uh, is G Friend, which turns out to be a girl band of some note and i have been um uh, not not for a while but i used to get deluged on twitter by either you know 12 year old japanese girls who love me <laughs> or well, you know 13 year old korean girls who say can i have can i have your handle yeah I'd, exactly, I'd really, exactly. Love, I'd really love to have your handle can you give me g friend Could, please, you know and uh, it's been it's been a very funny interchange but uh, you should make yourself their mascot you should say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to be your mascot. I tried. I actually tried to contact the group and be their mascot because they, apparently they have some environmental consciousness and I uh, thought it would be a nice play together. Um, I didn't I didn't make it through the handlers. So my boy, my boy humor says that 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 may have been a um, provocative invitation deal. It does sound a little odd. <laughs> I, will leave, I, will leave, I will leave you with that. I will just remind you, these were young innocents, so please, uh, down boy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, 
So, so two things. One, the thing Pete said earlier about how stress creates great music is totally one of my beliefs. And my favorite music era, I think I said this on our first music call, is from the 70s when American music was really weird. Uh, but in South America, there was a lot of repression and dictatorships. And so you get Nueva Trova, Tropicalismo, uh, and a couple other movements in Chile, Chilean, the Chilean Argentina, and Brazil. And, Ch and Chile. Yeah, Chile, Argentina, Brazil basically create insanely beautiful music that is protest music in different ways. Um, uh, David Byrne did a whole, David Byrne is, has incredible musical ear and tastes. And he did this whole series on Brazilian music, which was several albums and was just beautiful. Really loved them. Yep. Um, and, and if folks missed it, there was a long profile of David Byrne, I think on 60 Minutes in the last yeah. few months. That's quite, quite rich and insightful. Exactly. And then second thing, sort of an answer to Doug's great question, uh, because I think the stress, I think the stress comment uh, also addresses Doug's question, like, like the music reflects the times. And so I'm expecting some really good music to come out of this era because we're pretty stressed. But in contrast to that, and I think I mentioned it not on the music call, but somewhere else, April and I just went to see the Eros tour uh, movie. And I think Taylor Swift is a sign of the times. Uh, not merely because she's moving economies, which is a thing, like a major thing, uh, but also because her music, her, her music is mostly about heartbreak, um, usually with with boys and occasionally with uh, industries uh, like the music industry. And um, I don't know. It's, it's be before going to the movie, I couldn't recall a single uh, Taylor Swift tune. Like I, I, I was like. She's really popular. I know it. I think I've heard a couple of her songs. I couldn't sing one for you right now. And I remember the day when the first album I could sing back and forth was uh, Elton John's Captain Fantastic and the Brown Dirt Cowboy. And I could sing every word of every song on that. And I knew like when one song would end, my brain would start like the, the melody for the next song, that kind of thing. You've all been there before. Um, and and post post movie of the tour event, I had some earworms in my head where I found myself during the day, like humming a, a Taylor Swift tune. I'm like, well, at last. And I'm not sure that was a good thing. Um, Stuart. Uh, yeah, I know I've mentioned this before, but um, you know, my go-to is Jackson Brown over mm -hmm. the years. Um, and when I think about him and his music and his catalog, you know, he wrote some extraordinary existential stuff um, when, when he was in his, you know, late teens, early 20s. Um, and his music goes back to the, you know, late 60s. And it was, um, you know, introspective, what's life about and uh, and what am I doing and the kind of stuff that teenagers and young 20 folks, you know, think about. And um, I've always followed him and seen him, you know, uh, every few years, whenever I can catch him. And um, when I was dealing with, with my late wife's illness, I missed one of his albums in 2014, I think. And when I went back and listened to it, it was just extraordinary social commentary. And, you know, whenever I, whenever I, I kind of am losing it, um, I put his music on and it just amazingly just touches my heart. It's so incredibly healing, um, the musicality of it, but also the lyrics of it you know, telling me that I'm not alone, that there's this great artist that's really listening. And um, he had another album a couple of years ago called Standing in the Breach. And, uh, and, and recently in the last year or two, he had an album, um, I can't remember the name of it, um, you, you know, but it's very, very current in terms of what's going on in the world. And still half of his albums have great pop tunes that, that just, you know, that you just, you know, in a, in a Taylor Swift modality, um, but they also kind of, you know, say something. Um, and um, of late, uh, I've, I've, I've got this inclination to travel, to go see Billy Joel um, in his, final tours because he can't you know Madison Square Garden is impossible you can hardly get tickets but um there's a show of his in Tampa I think sometime in um in February and he's performing with Sting and Sting is an ex a, another 
um, extraordinary um, performer with with amazingly rich vocal tones and lyrics. And you know, he's been a a, a Buddhist practitioner and a meditator um, all of his life, and you know, has managed to sustain a forty year old forty year marriage. I think in his in in the context of his music wrote a great Broadway show that wasn't a, was a critical success, but not a, a commercial success about growing up in a seaport um, um, in, uh, in, 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 in England. So um, yeah, and, and that's, you know, some of the, I, I'll go along with Pete in terms of doing a little bit of um, preparation to pay a cup, to play a couple of the um, contemporary Jackson Brown songs that really speak to the challenges that we're facing. I mean, he talks, you know, from immigration to climate to um, um, to ownership rights to, I mean, boom, boom, boom. And the other interesting thing about him is that over the last couple of years, you know, he always had great hair, and obviously it was it was styled before he went on stage, and um, he's he stopped doing that. And he just let himself go, go kind of um, shaggy. It's still long, but maybe he let himself go kind of shaggy. And the last concert I saw of his um, was in Napa a couple of years ago. And it was like going to a revival meeting. It was like this preacher, you know, trying to wake people up, you know, in, in, in song. Um, and um yeah, so I, I I just can't say enough about Mr. Brown. As a matter of fact, I got I, I Jennifer was never a big fan, and I took her to one of her con one of his concerts, this one in Napa, and um, you know she's playing on her iPhone while the concert is going on, and I almost whacked her and just said, <laughs> "There's fucking magic coming off the stage. It deserves a hundred percent of your attention to listen to what he's saying." And now you know, she's become a fan. So, so you'll, you'll, you'll appreciate then that I took Jane to a Grateful Dead New Year show at the Oakland uh, Auditorium once. Yeah. Um, and we had, we had, um, you know, nosebleed seat tickets somehow. And uh, I went down to the floor to dance and she stayed up there studying anatomy flashcards. <laughs> so <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> Um, Pete, thank you for the long list of, of, uh, hazardous music. Maybe there should be a whole genre. Like caution, beware all ye who enter here. So if we're talking about contemporary music, I, I think that, you know, the whole genre of rap and, and, and it, where it comes from. You know, certainly deserves mention and taking and taking taking a look at 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 its you know uh, ideation. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, something flashed for me too. I, 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 it's not rap. Um, it's pop, but it's kind of noise pop from the UK. Um, there's a uh, there's a band called Bones, um, and their big hit is about being women and having somebody say um uh it's called pretty waste um uh it's like uh that they, they're they're hot looking women um and they don't want to be hot looking women they just want to be people um so uh they they turned into a song uh somebody's you know offhand catcalling comment you know what a, what a waste of a, of a pretty face um you know on you so another song that they had, I, I just heard it yesterday. I, I remembered that I really liked it. Um, it's uh, I'm Afraid of Americans. <laughs> it's, it's the song. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. <laughs> What's noise pop? New term for me. Um. There's there's a genre of uh, and and it's not a, a technical term it's it's the way kind of I classify it in my head um, they use a lot of kind of distortion and uh, it sounds loud so it's kind of like the 
uh, to 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 say something that I wouldn't be happy to hear if I were Bones uh, UK. Um, it's it's kind of like the bubblegum pop version of of heavy metal. Um, so it's got noise to it, but I'm not actually a bubblegum pop person. That's what I, I like listening to best. So um, another really good example, um, it's, it's not quite pop, um, but there was uh, uh, some music that I was really enchanted by. It's a, a guy uh, named Boretta. Um, I'll put a, a link. And it, it was really amazing to me. The first time I heard it, I guess I heard it on a... Um, on a dance, somebody was doing dance to it. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't parse it as music. I, it just sounded like noise. Um, uh, and, um, but noise with a, a beat and a rhythm and stuff like that. And, and so I, that was like super enchanting. Um, and I listened to it for a while and then I could finally hear that, oh, it sounded like something that you couldn't make with MIDI. Um, uh, and it's like, how did, how did that, you know, how did he orchestrate that noise? And then after a while, my brain deconstructed it and I could hear the, the melody and the, you know, the, the, I could hear that he did it with MIDI, but, um, super, super cool. Um, and noise. Um, let me find that one. Um, back to Gil's comment about the variety of music available, I'm on completely on both sides of that, because on the one hand, you can reach out and listen to anything on the planet that you want to. A while ago, I haven't done this in a while, but there's a, a website or a station that let, basically lets you tune into radio, live radio from anywhere on the planet. Yeah. And so you could go listen to Ghanaian, uh, you know, a music channel station and see what they're playing and listen to them comment, you know, comment locally and hear the local ads and the whole thing which is just a lovely way to sort of travel uh, virtually. And then, Pete, it might have been you who said this somewhere recently, but music is being produced and homogenized. And also, uh, as, as we start to get uh, generative AI-produced music, it tends to, like, there's this blending towards the mean of some sort, and it starts to really sound alike. It starts to... to uh, we start to lose the variety in some weird way because there's a certain set of hooks and rhythms and whatever else, tempi and things that make a song uh, go viral and they're everybody's after audience. Go ahead, Gil. You're muted. Well, that's John Cage, right? Channeling John Cage. Um, there's something fascinating about the the... I don't know if it's an interplay or distinction or something. There's mashups, which is one of the phenomenon of these times. It's not just diversity, but mashups. I'm thinking of like, um, I just heard this week, an Israeli Arab peace song being done in African high life style. It was terrific. And it was like this moment of joy in the grief of now. Kind of, it actually broke. It was the first time my tears broke through in the current Israel-Palestine Gaza. But it was a mashup of these two very different worlds. And somehow that, feels different than homogenization. They're both blending of different traditions, but they somehow work differently. And I value the mashups and I hate the homogenization. And I don't know what the difference is between them exactly. For me, mashups were a really uh, creative phase because they uh, a lot of mashups I saw involved really different things brought together in a way where you're like, damn, those things work together. And there, were, there was a bunch of insight and creativity there. And mashups weren't, from my perspective, an attempt to uh, get a lot of audience and, and hack, hack music tastes in order to win the, the top 40 contest kind of thing. So I like mashups a lot. Um, and I, I think I mentioned last call that, that Madeon, I think I, I added it to the, the chat. There's a French guy named Madeon who uses an Ableton and it says, and the name of the song is These Are My 30 Favorite Songs. And he creates a mashup of these 30 songs that is, that is itself a lovely tune uh, and, a, and a really interesting tune in different ways. And so, you know, more of that is great. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, I just, I think that um, it's really such a subjective experience in terms of how certain, you know, rhythms hit your essential vibration that's just you know so so important uh, noise came up i can't listen to noise you know like acid jazz anything in jazz that goes into the 
acid quality. I just, I just can't listen. It, 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 it. Um, I find it <laughs> like nails, you know, scrunching on a, on a, on a, on a blackboard. Um, yeah, it depends on my mood. Yeah, that, that's, that's. Things that I, there's things that I can't stand some of the time, but are exactly welcome some of the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, generally, gen generally, um, I think it's extremely poignant that the that your phone's ringtone just went off during this call. That was great. Speaking yeah, thank you. Um, that's actually that's actually Jennifer calling from Bangkok. Um, so I'll get her back as soon as I finish saying what I what I <laughs> what I wanted to say. A um, couple of other things, you know, pop up for me um, as 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 really wonderful favorites. Um, Paul Williams, um, short guy. Had an Academy Award-winning song um, with Barbara Streisand, I think, called Evergreen, um, and he disappeared for a while. And you know, as he became famous, he, um, you know, got into addiction, and then he disappeared because he became an addiction ca uh, um, uh, counselor. And then I saw this—I can't remember where I saw it, but he was performing in San Francisco about 15, 18 years ago um, in a very small venue. And I, I bought three of the CDs and she's, he's just got a marvelous tonal quality and, 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 and um, amazing pr uh, presence to him. And, and then there's, you know, one of the all time favorite Motown pieces, you know, Marvin Gaye's uh, What's Going On that some think is one of the greatest um, song albums ever produced and the whole genre of Motown, including, you know, one of my favorites, Ashford and Simpson. I don't know if anybody's ever listened to them, but a couple that just, you know, um, wrote and recorded and did some amazingly wonderful music. I saw them at um, uh, um, at the Nico just a couple of years before um, uh, Ashford died. Um, beautiful, beautiful um, individuals. I also love, uh, you mentioned What's Going On, which is a gorgeous song all by its lonesome. And then people do things, I'll, I'll paste it into the chat in a second. I'll just have to see that the URL still works. But it's like what's going on performed by performers all around the world. Mm -hmm. And they're all kind of listening to the tune and recording it themselves. And then somebody edited it together just very beautifully. And it's really moving. Uh, it just it moves around the world, but it's also very moving. Hey, Julian. Morning. Greetings. Julian, what's your go-to music, either genre or song or thing? I don't have a go-to one. I like everything from the year 1600 to now. It's That's more broad. It's more what I don't like. Uh, let's see, country, uh, rap, hip hop. And one of the things I've noticed is I tend to prefer symphonic stuff. So for example, you know, Beethoven, like everyone is a favorite of mine, but if you get more modern, Pro, what they call prog rock like yes but if, if you look at yes's music it's actually they're actually a small symphony and uh when you listen to rap or hip-hop there's nothing but a beat and people speaking words there's there's no exercise in creating music there i mean it technically qualifies as music right by the oxford dictionary definition but uh it's it's in the answer to what's to go to it's really where do they go ways well, Rolling Stone made the mistake of missing hip hop entirely and became irrelevant really quickly. Um, I don't know how or why, but that's just my my knowledge. I, I, I want to I want to I mentioned Ted Joya uh, last uh, last call we had on music. He is a phenomenal, prolific music analyst. He's incredible. Uh, I'll post a, a link to his Substack here, but I'm I'm on his Substack, and I I, I just don't know how he does all the things that he does. Uh, Pete, go ahead. Good. Uh, could, Pete, can I throw in one other thing? Yeah, please. I think in the past, I've mentioned my senior thesis at Berkeley. And when that kid of mine comes up here, he's going to photograph the, the drawings. And I'm going to assemble a PDF of that thesis along with the output and have that available. And it uh, might be in the University of California archives. So, Hey, uh, I, I like Julian's observation of... Um, 
it's funny, I, I had a, a similar way of describing my musical taste uh, when I was uh, entering Caltech. Um, one of the things that, that what, what music you like to listen to was really important because uh, people would end up playing their stereos really loud um, with their, their doors open in the dorm. And so if everybody kind of got along, it was good. So I remember describing, you know, I like any kind of music except country. Um, I don't, I don't know if that's really true or not, but, uh, but anyway, I, I like the Julian's distinction between symphonic and, and maybe pop, um, the, the, the period of time over which you evolve themes, um, and, uh, you know, and how many different kinds of themes you want to mix together and stuff like that. It's, it's a really interesting phenomenon. I, it reminds me of science fiction. Um, I learned, yeah, I, I started reading science fiction when I was like 10 or 12 or something like that. And I, I just read voraciously. Um, and I learned that I cared a lot more about the ideas of a story than the exposition of a story. And so I, I let, got shorter and shorter. And so, you know, a, a, like a 1500 word story um, with a lot of interesting ideas was always a lot more fun for me than, you know, a hundred thousand word novel, you know, with maybe the same number of ideas, but spread out over lots of exposition. Um, I also wanted to come back to what Stuart said about the way the rhythm or whatever the, there, there's, there's definitely music that I listen to that most people wouldn't listen to and vice versa, right? Um, and it's, I, it, I feel like it's, I don't know how this works, but um, I remember when my daughter used to do dance stuff, um, uh, you know, we'd go to dance recitals um, four or five, six times a year. And uh, there's a selection of, you know, cool pop songs or whatever that the kids are dancing to. And there were certain songs where it was like, okay, I, for me, it was like, okay, stop everything. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm just going to focus on, I don't know, the melody or the rhythm or whatever about this particular song, right? And it always surprised me that everybody else didn't like have to just stop and like listen. Um, and, you know, obviously it's different for different people, but, um, I, it was, you know, there's, I, the, the, it's a real thing and it makes it weird to share about music kind of, because you can't say this is the best song ever because, you know, it's the best one for you and it's not necessarily the best for, for other folks. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Julian. I made a cryptic comment in the uh, chat window about 145, which in music theory is the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant chords. And what you, we call pop music is generally this progression. It sounds nice to the ear to go from the tonic to the, through the subdominant up into the dominant. It sounds nice, um, but it's very simplistic. And if you listen to, say, uh, Lawrence Welk music, um, this would be the kind of harmonic progression it goes through showing no imagination. And I'm gonna bang on rap and hip hop again because they don't even do that. They never modulate. They just stick with, they pick a tonic and maybe they'll modulate to another tonic later, but there's just, there's no exploration of music generation. So. Uh, Gil. Yeah, on, on that note, Julian, there's incredible stuff on YouTube these days of, you know, not just the world of music, but the world of investigating music, probing music, unpacking music theory, unpacking the you know the 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 struct the, the chordal structure of stuff, really fascinating stuff, which I never learned in any substantive way. Uh, I mean, my best music education was Leonard Bernstein's Young People concerts, which still stand up, by the way. Uh, there's one there's one piece on YouTube that says like you know like best three minutes of music education I'd ever get, and it's not you know it, it, it's up there as a candidate. Uh, but um, you know Rick Vito analyzing pop music, a bunch of a bunch of pianists who play all sorts of things in the styles of different people, and then un unpack what the musical structure uh, and dynamics are in that. So really rich opportunity to uh, both get exposed to different kind of music and also get some understanding of of, of what's happening when you listen to things. Uh, and how different um, tonal qualities and moods and so forth are generated. Uh, Before going to Pete, just to add to your marvel, like you can learn to play instruments now just by watching YouTube videos and grabbing an instrument and trying and trying again. It's astonishing. 
So, wow. so just one thing on that. I've been for the last few nights. I have been just playing every cover I could find of um, um, okay, the name just left me. Of, of um, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. You too. Uh huh. Many versions of them and many versions of other people, and some of them very rocking and some of them very quiet. And one I just stumbled on last night. A, a soft um, um, finger picking guitar instrumental rendering of it that is both very different and very congruent with the original mood of the song. So that's one of my current votes. Lovely. Wow. Pete. I, I love finding a, like a song that a bunch of people have done and, and the different kinds of versions of it. And it's, it's surprising. Sometimes a really spar sparse one uh, kind of captures the the song better than a lot of other other things. Um, uh, I wanted to come back to Julian talking about kinds of music and certainly the you know uh, one four five pop thing. A lot of pop music. The it's it's interesting. The um, the musical exploration is very limited. You know it it does like you know a, a very minute fraction of the things that you should be doing to modulate stuff. Um, there's, it, it, I'm reminded, um, for, for, uh, a number of years, I was super into a subgenre of, uh, music coming out of London, uh, that was called drum and bass. And they used almost entirely, it was built around one drum, uh, one drum sample and, uh, it goes really fast. Uh, and it, it, I think it tickles my noise thing. Um, but, um, but I listened to enough of it. I was entranced just by the sound of that sample, I think, uh, uh, that I listened to enough of it that I started to realize that the modulation in the song, they, they would have these four or five minute songs that sounded almost the same the whole way through. But what was happening was the modulation was the way that they repeated the sample would change. And it actually evolved over time. So it wouldn't be a, a, a quick dramatic thing, but over the course of a couple of minutes, you could hear the evolution of the way that the sample is getting um, getting repeated. And that was actually the musical content of the whole piece, more or less. Um, it was this slow evolution of uh, playing with the rhythm and probably a little bit of the, the tonality and stuff like that. And it, it got so that I could listen to that, um, uh, you know, somewhere in between a symphonic sound, a symphonic thing and a, and a pop thing. It was this other thing that was modulating a different part of music than than is normally modulated, and it was a lot of fun to listen to. You're muted. Thank you. Sorry, beginner's mistake. Um, you're reminding me of Steve Reich's piano phase, which dates back to 1967, where the same exact piece is played by two pianists next to each other in slightly different tempi, so that the pieces basically uh, go out of tune, cross, and then come back into synchronization. It's just really interesting because you know exactly what's coming next, and you have no idea what's coming next. It's 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 like you get immediately what's happening. And then it's interesting at every little turn because of because of the the overlay the overlap. It's really cool. Uh, now you're muted. All right, go ahead. Back. Yeah. Um. So Jerry, after I made my comment about Plato, uh, you paraphrased it as uh, music tells us about the contemporary moment. That's not what Plato meant. He meant the opposite that the music tells you about the culture and closer to what uh, uh, we were he hearing from Julian, that it's what's missing in the contemporary music that tells you a lot about the culture that you're in. Um, can, you, um, uh, can you find the right quote so I can not misquote when I quote it? And does anybody else have background on this or anybody, or do, you, do you or anybody anyone else want to dive deeper into it? Because for me, like, I, I see music often reflecting what culture is doing, not what culture is missing. But I think both things are probably happening all the time. And well, I, I don't have a direct uh, source, but uh, 
music was really important for the Greeks who saw that the structure of the universe was musical. And therefore that music ought to be the basis for all ed education along with dance. And that's such a far cry from where we are in the appreciation of it. So the music and mathematics went together as a single subject for the Greeks. Mm -hmm. uh, back when we were talking about that, I found this page on Plato and music, which I was gonna read later. Um, it's clearly really central and important to his philosophy and not something I knew about. And anyone else want to jump in on this particular slice? Okay, then. A um, couple things. What else? What other, what other twists and turns? Uh, should we do another call on music or should we switch to visual art with a lot more notice? Uh, I apologize that there was such short notice. I was just like, last night I was enthused that our last music call had been so good. So I figured I would put it on the menu. Um, but you're right, it's it's more fun to have more time to prep uh, on topics like these. And we, we last time had said, why don't we switch to different arts? So one thing we could do is like visual arts or something uh, or sculpture or like you tell me what you'd like to go into. And then uh, just a note I want to add is it's nice to have a couple of calls in OGM where we're not talking about global demise and our collective crises and catastrophes. It's actually really, really nice to, to be in a more positive space, even though we're well-intentioned when we talk about all the crises. <clears throat> so thoughts? Steering? Steering committee. Steer. Yes, is my thought. Perfect. <laughs> All you just said, Jerry. Mm -hmm. it, it occurs to me kind of that um, I feel like I can talk a little bit more fluently about music, having watched a, a ton of YouTube videos of people talking about music. Um, and similarly, I was like, I wonder how you could talk about visual arts. But then I realized I've got a lot of kind of technical knowledge at least about um, uh, image composition and contrast and color and things like that. But so in, in, a, in a space where there's a fair amount of existing kind of thought and um, thought and exposition about, um, you know, about the art form, then, then there's a framework within which we could, you know, work to, to speak better. Sculpture, for instance, on the other hand, I, you know, I don't know how to I tackle that as as well, kind of. Um, it's interesting because um, it seems like we could also kind of mash together a recent topic with the visual arts topic, which would be like storytelling plus visual arts. Uh, that would be an interesting combo to go into because a lot of people are experimenting with how to do storytelling with funky new media. Uh, and there's a lot out there. So that might be a good uh, a good path in. We could also do literature. Um, not so much nonfiction, um, but literature. Um, yeah. You know. Um, yeah. There were there were. Um, <laughs> I just started watching this last night. We we could do media. We could do TV shows. Um, <laughs> you want to you want to take a temperature reading of the culture go look at what's playing on tv exactly Ex exactly um one of the books i read this year was called chemistry lessons um which is a wonderful novel completely entertaining novel and it's now a um a series on Apple TV that I watched a few episodes of yesterday. It's, Is it Lessons in Chemistry? Yeah, Lessons in Chemistry. Bonnie Garmus. Pardon? Bonnie Garmus. Yeah, that's that. That's it. It's about a woman who aspires to be a chem chemist, and she's and um, <clears throat> and she ends up um, doing a cooking show. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. It was a very entertaining uh, read. And um, and they made a good TV 
uh, show. Uh, it's just coming out now. I saw the trailer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Pete just put Understanding Comics uh, in the chat, one of my favorite books about like not just Understanding Comics, which is the self-evident title, but about how our perceptual systems work, how we frame things, the magic of the artistry of things. Uh, the McLeod, is, I've, I've met him. I met him at a, at a conference once uh, years ago. Really interesting guy too. Um, that's really like, so analysis of art's effects on us might be a, a slice. So going a little meta on the whole thing. Yeah, and, and the thought that I just had in response to that, Jerry, was that the idea that, um, you know, each of us, <clears throat> because we're different, is um, attracted to different art forms for whatever reason. And um, a, a little bit of explication of, you know, why you're attracted to that art form and what in it is um, is of value um, to you and might be of value to, to others, you know. I mean, I know there's a lot of art, art forms, you know, that I just kind of poo-poo a little bit. I don't take the time to dig in, but if somebody else inspired me, I might try it out. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Pete. Hey, I had a gift from Michael Lennon on a on a on a um one-on-one -on -one call I had with him where <clears throat> I I was I had just finished watching probably um Maitri singing Dynamite. Um, I was all excited and, and alive about uh, the, you know, the artistry of, of that and the, the harmony that this group had. And, uh, and so I got excited about that and they explained more about, you know, we went to different a cappella groups and different live performances and stuff like that. And I'm always self-conscious about that because I know, as previously we, we talked about, not all the same music is the same interest to other people or like Stuart, you were just saying, you know, different things are, are, are interesting to different people. Um, the, the gift that I got from him was like, Pete, um, it turns out that, you know, maybe the thing that you're, you're excited about is not the theme, thing I'm excited about, but I loved seeing the passion that you had and the excitement that you had and, and hearing the story of it you know, I, now I can look at, at the things, some of the things you showed me and there, there are just details I never would have known about. You know, you told me a whole story about, you know, the, the, the details in the background of it because you knew about it and because you were passionate about it. And so it, it reminded me that <clears throat> sometimes having, you know, even if you're not interested in it, having a, a guide who's super passionate about it, helps you appreciate something that you wouldn't have before. And it helps you um, like learn about uh, a lot of stuff that you just completely missed. That, and maybe you, you might even get excited about something because there's part of it that you were missing because you'd never had an introduction to it. That, you know, once you've, you've had an introduction, it's like, oh, I get it. Let me look for more of that. It's lovely. Our, our I love the word amateur um which is about love you know amare and also dilettante is a word that's been like really deprecated because to be a dilettante is not good but that comes from delight that comes mm -hmm. from the italian delight um because it's somebody who delights in a lot of things and our sharing of our love for things is i think fascinating and and a wonderful way to go into things gary thanks for that explication of dilettante i love it <laughs> and appreciate it not a bad word. Good no, word. No, no. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Good word. Um, Doug is an ace on etymologies, uh, especially when it comes to capitalism and related phenomena. Um, there are also like, uh, we're all from Western tradition and uh, in Bali, they have, um, now I'm even forgetting what it's called. What are the performances in Bali called? Um, the puppet oh, shows? Nah. How can I have forgotten it so quickly? Uh, please hold. The gang war. Pardon? The uh, orchestra, the gang war orchestra. Yes, exactly. But what's the name of the orchestras? Gamelan, that's it. 
you, you said it, but you said it, but I didn't hear it properly. Yeah, gamelan music, and and also uh, if you go uh, watch kabuki theater or whatever, the kind of Asian music and scales that they're using and the way the performances work is dramatically different from what is pleasing to the Western ear, and really interesting. And and the blend of the two is often really fun. Uh, and interesting. And there's a, yeah, a couple artists uh, like David Byrne and others who've kind of gone and traveled widely. Uh, Paul Simon, I think, is one who's done a good job of that too. Uh, there are a bunch of people who who uh, went lots of different places. And you know, it, it's weird though. When, when Paul Simon started doing that, people jumped on him for, quote, appropriation. Like, you know, how can you dare do this? You're stealing music from other people. Um, but music has always been mashing up. And moving around and adapting and mod, you know modifying itself. St Sting in this, I think it's in this wonderful film called Bring On the Night, which I encourage people to see if you haven't. Michael Apted um, um, movieization of the um, of, of of Sting's entry into jazz mashup, um, and uh, someone accused him of his stuff sounding like other people's stuff, and he said uh, he said you know genius borrows nobly. And it wasn't meant as a, I don't think it was meant as a self-inflating comment, but to say that that's what that's what artists do. They're influenced by each other, and you know we all we're all influenced by our lives and incorporate our experiences and manifest them in the ways that we do. That's a good point, Gil, because you think about it when you study art. They they talk so much about how this one artist traveled from Madrid to Paris and saw this other artist painting and decided to do something about it. And in classical art study, this is considered the proper thing. It's called, you know, it's called being influenced yeah. by each other and by life and experience. So, yeah. Yeah. And it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be limited to painting, right? right. As you point out, if this music does this, if we dug around, we'd probably even see it in software development, which is, I would point out, an art according to Donald Knuth. So. <clears throat> well, in some interesting way, Knuth's uh, epical, nearly biblical tomes from his first, from his what was he in grad school when he wrote them? Like incredibly young, uh, were him offering his shoulders up to everybody else. It's like, hey, here's a whole bunch of like fundamental algorithms and ways of seeing programming. And then, and then, the libraries and the places we've come to in programming. I, I, I would be really interested in just hearing a couple people who run deep in this, like Pete and Julian. Uh, basically to describe the different eras of computing that even they've experienced in their lives, because what was possible or what we were doing uh, five and 10 years ago has changed dramatically from today and never mind 30 years ago, right? I mean, I, I got an, my first computer was an Apple II Plus. I'm not a programmer, but I was learning how to like fall through to monitor mode and wander around in the memory of the computer and you've got to do special things now to do that, to fall through the, the figment that's on screen and, and see how the thing works. That'd be fun. Thanks, Bile. DP. Um, I was having a conversation just yesterday where we, where I was complaining about how books lock away knowledge uh, and came up with a variant on standing on the shoulders of giants. It's like the giants are being kidnapped and uh, sort of locked away. And I, I said it more elegantly yesterday. I'm trying to find that because I thought I took notes about it, but I didn't. Anyway, um, I feel like we've talked through where we are right now on this. We could wrap the call early or we could go someplace that you'd rather go. I'm open to either. Be happy to wrap. Do you want to start wrapping? Uh -huh. it, did. it just was a topical pun. I couldn't resist. It was like you gave me a layup. I took it. But that that was my wrap, Jerry. I'm done. You're done. That was the shortest wrap I've ever heard. Do you know about the comic strip pearls before swine? I think so. I've heard of it. But but you know that every third day is a, some really magnificent pun. So. <laughs> <clears throat> we'll go find it. <laughs> um, well, cool. Why don't we wrap this call and uh, see you all in a week. Safe travels, safe healing. Um, 
Thanks for being on the call from Malaysia, Doug. Enjoy your music. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Okay.